I have a few stragglers, and um, Dr. Morris is looking at me as I have multiple pages to introduce, but I will not. I will keep this short. So it is my uh, absolute pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Stephen Morris, who's coming to us from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Morris is the Ferdinand Wakeman Hubble Professor of Law at Penn. He's also a professor of psychology and law in the psychiatry of the School of Medicine at Penn and associate director of their Center for Neuroscience and Society. I think he's also one of the founding directors of the um, MacArthur Foundation Research Network on law and neuroscience. And so he comes to us as one of the premier uh, figures in neuro law today. Uh, and many years before. So Dr. Morris earned his BA at Tufts and then went on to get a law degree from Harvard and a master's degree at Harvard in education and then decided he wanted to change the world and so he pursued a PhD in psychology and development at Harvard and uh, since then has been a uh, board certified and licensed psychologist in addition to being uh, an attorney and professor of law. So um, he is a prolific writer and has uh, written in numerous journals, both law and um, psychology, psychiatry, and is an editor on the, on the editorial board of a number of journals as well. And uh, just he's also given testimony on, in Congress about uh, psychiatric aspects of jurisprudence. And uh, just was recently awarded uh, the prestigious Ray Isaac award from the American Psychiatric Association for his work. So uh, with that, I will uh, introduce Dr. Stephen Morris, who will talk to us today about uh, aspects of neural law. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm actually rather surprised by the weather. I think I'm in an alternative universe when I see Seattle so clear. But I'm, I'm told that it often happens in, in this month. I've never been here before in October. Uh, let me tell you what the talk is going to do. I'm going to start with a case study presentation. I'm first going to tell you about it clinically, and then we're going to figure out what was the diagnostic procedure. I'm not going to ask any of you because I don't want to embarrass anybody. And what was the diagnosis? And it's a case that involves a clinical problem and a legal problem. And it's a real intuition pump in a certain direction for thinking about the relation between neuroscience, broadly speaking, it's actually a neurology case, and the law. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain conceptually what the law's concept of the person is, criteria for responsibility, and the like. Once we have in mind how the law views these things, then we're ready to talk about what the contribution of neuroscience, neurology, might be. And having done all that, I'm going to talk about the major challenges that neuroscience, broadly speaking, once again, I'm not going to now qualify it every time, broadly speaking, what neuroscience challenges are for the future of the law. My conclusion is going to be the law's concept of the person and responsibility is really secure. And that neurology and neuroscience generally are not going to change it in any major way Although it's certainly, as we get more and more advances, both clinically and scientifically, it's going to produce data that could be very useful to us. But the basic structure of the person and responsibility are to be intact. Having done that, I'm going to return to my clinical case study, a man named Mr. Oft, O-F-T. That's my name. It's a pseudonym. I don't know his real name. And I'm going to apply my model of thinking about these things to Mr. Oft, because you're going to think it's the case that puts the most pressure possible on my model. And what I'm going to argue is if my model works for Mr. Oft, it works for anybody. And I'm right. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Mr. Oft, 40-year-old school teacher with an absolutely unremarkable medical legal history. School teacher, good old guy. He's married to a woman who has been divorced and has a, a the relevant times, 11 or 12 year old stepdaughter. Lifelong interest in pornography. At a certain point in time, when things start to get interesting in this case, he starts to develop an intense interest in child pornography, a really intense interest, and starts to download it intensively. At the same time, uncharacteristically for him, he starts going to massage parlors. 
and not for deep muscle relaxation. He and his wife had a, uh, I don't know what to call it, a routine with the stepdaughter, biological daughter of mom, of getting into bed with her when she was going to sleep to soothe her to go to sleep. Nothing untoward going on, they just did. At the time in question, when he's developed this intense interest in child pornography and going to massage parlors, mom gets a job outside the home at bedtime for the stepdaughter. The stepfather, our guy, Mr. Roft, continues to go to bed with the stepdaughter to soothe her, except now he does more than soothe her. He molests her. And he molests her very significantly, although to the best of our knowledge, he never did penetrate her. All right. He's behaving completely unremarkably at work and at home. Wife suspects nothing. His co-workers suspect nothing. He's teaching school kids. He's not touching them. Finally, the stepdaughter outs him. She goes to the school guidance counselor and says, my stepfather has been molesting me. The guidance counselor reports this to the mom. The mom hacks the computer, discovers the child pornography, calls the police. He's taken from the home. He's arrested. And he is charged with, this all took place in the state of Virginia. I don't know the, uh, the Virginia statute, but the one I'm most familiar with is lewd and lascivious conduct upon the body of a minor. Serious felony charge. And as the legal system works, it takes a long time. And finally, he is convicted. First time offender. And the judge looks at this guy who's got otherwise a perfectly good history and says, look, I'm going to send you to an inpatient program for people with sexual disorders. If you pass it, I'm going to put you on probation. No prison time. And as you're probably all aware, nobody does worse in prison than child molesters. And so he's got every incentive to pass this program. He goes in the program, and the first thing you know, he's molesting and importuning both other patients and staff for sexual favors. He's warned repeatedly, you have to stop this or you're going to fail the program. He fails the program, he's going to prison. He fails the program. So now he's got to go to prison. And he's got a sentencing date. The night before sentencing, he develops, he says, severe headache. And he goes to the emergency room at the University of Virginia Medical Center in Charlottesville and complains of severe headache. He also says, I want to kill myself, and I'd like to rape my landlady. They admit him, get this, as a pedophile. I mean, strikes me, given the presentation, that's a strange diagnosis to admit him. Next morning, headache is really severe, and he's starting to develop the gait problem. So, they think he maybe is malingering, but now he's starting to look, maybe he's not, they send him down for a neurological consult. In the consulting room, he urinates on himself, and he's totally unconcerned with it. He starts molesting the staff, the nurses that were assisting the doc, touching them without their permission sexually. He is utterly intact in terms of orientation. His prosody is just fine. He's conceptually fine. He has a classic constructional apraxia and a graphia. And his gait is getting really bad, a lot of titubation. They ask him to do a bedside go, no, go. Fine. No problem whatsoever inhibiting the prepotent response. But he's now looking, you know, urinating on himself and unconcerned, bad gait problem, the apraxia, the agraphia. Okay, now he's looking, frankly, neuro. A diagnostic, as we say in the case records of the Massachusetts General Hospital, a diagnostic procedure was performed. Well, we all know what it was. He gets an MRI. No, the wrong way. Oops. Well, this was going to be my little homily first. You'll have to wait a second. Genetics may yet threaten privacy, kill autonomy, make society homogeneous, and gut the concept of human nature. Terrible things, wouldn't they be? But neuroscience could do all those things first. Well, the bulk of this talk is... Don't worry, it's all going to be all right. That's not going to happen. Uh, the next two slides are just long quotes. One, totally reductionist. The other saying, anti-reduction. So here's Mr. Roft. Well, as I said at the law school when I did this, 
The first, this, by the way, all can, comes from the Archives of Neurology 2003. Burns and Swerdlow are the authors. My chair of neurology then at Penn, when he first saw this slide, he hadn't seen the original article. He saw this slide. This guy's a character, Branch Causal. Some of you may know him. He knows him. He looks, that's not supposed to be there. Right? <laughs> well, that's right. And it's resected. It turns out, by the way, to be hemangiopericytoma. And it's resected. Okay? Two days later. And he's got none of the other neurological signs and symptoms. None. And he reports, I have no interest in children whatsoever. So the judge, being a sensible person, says, okay, I'm going to send you back to the treatment program, and let's see how you do this time. So he goes back to the treatment program. Pass it with flying colors. No problem. Put on probation, and his wife agrees to let him back home. Okay, fine. And he's fine. He's doing just fine again. He's got his job back. He's doing fine. Eight months later, headache is back, and the interest in children is back. Guess what else is back? He has to be resected again. And he's fine again. Now, he stayed at home for a couple of years. Uh, there is a BBC videotape of him about four years after the second resection. At that point, he was divorced from his wife. But he's interviewed, and I'm not a neurologist. You know, I'm not a bedside neurologist, as well you know. But I evaluate people all the time. And I look at this guy. He looks utterly unremarkable. Okay? So here's the time series. Given the time series, we know that he would not have had the pedophilic urges but for the tumor. I mean, just the time series is just too clear. And we know without the pedophilic urges, he's unlikely to have acted on them. Now, there's a dispute among the people I've talked to about this case about whether and all the neurologists I've talked to, I think people in this audience may feel a little bit differently, all the neurologists I've talked to take the position, this case is a one-off. There's obviously no spot for pedophilia. There's no spot for acting on the pedophilia or anything of the sort. And this is a really one-off. This is a highly unusual case. Nonetheless, nonetheless, it raises really interesting issues because when the law charges him and convicts him, it's not for having the pedophilic urges. It would be unconstitutional to punish someone for having the wrong urges. He's charged and punished for acting on them. And so one of the interesting questions is this. I want you to think of when he first touched his stepdaughter and looked otherwise pretty unremarkable as T1. I want you to think about the time in the consulting room, which had to have been minimum eight months, maybe even a year later, when he was touching the nurses without permission in the consulting room as T2, because touching the nurses without permission is itself a crime, a much less serious crime, but it's a crime. How should we think about Mr. Off's responsibility at both times? And after I do my little shtick, I'm going to come back and tell you how I think we ought to do it. This, by the way, this is a case of a guy who had a huge subarachnoid cyst and completely unremarkable, completely unremarkable behaviorally his entire life, who strangled his wife to death, upper middle class businessman, convicted. I don't use it anymore. The case is too easy because there was nothing wrong with him except the cyst. And when he went to prison, he was offered to have it aspirated. He said no. Why do we care about freedom and responsibility, which is what the law is concerned with, mostly? Although, I'm going to end with some things that have nothing to do with criminal law, where neuroscience can really maybe help us out these days. Because our notions of freedom and responsibility are crucial to our moral and political lives together. We think of ourselves as agents, as creatures who can be guided by reasons. And that's really important to our sense of ourselves, our sense of how we live together, to our human dignity. This is true both for morality and for law. I'm a physicalist. Despite anything I say, I'm a physicalist. 
There's matter to begin with. You know, we don't have minds independent of our brains. Your brain is dead, you're dead, you're not doing anything of interest at all. So, you know, yes, we don't have minds independent of our brains. There's no top-down soul or top-down intelligence. Although, interestingly enough, matter can produce non-material things. Think about culture. There's no culture without creatures to create it and the like. So, there's only one thing. But, you can either be a reductive monist or you can be a non-reductive monist. I, for one, am a non-reductive monist, and I'll be saying a few words about that. Meaning, I don't think that your mental states are just brain states. I think mental states do independent explanatory work in explaining human behavior. Yes, they are enabled by the brain. They do not exist without the brain, but we don't at all understand how the brain enables the mind. We know that it does, but we don't know how it works. And that may be the hardest problem in all science, according to many people. Now, I believe if you want a complete explanation of human behavior, a complete explanation, you've got to be multi-field, multi-level. So again, if I'm trying to explain why you people are sitting here in this room today, there are going to be biological variables at work. Again, your brain is dead, you wouldn't be here, presumably. So, you know, and we can look at those biological variables at the molecular level, we can look at them at the systems level, etc. There are psychological variables at work, and there are sociological variables at work to give you a full explanation. Depending on what we are trying to explain, which level of explanation is going to be the most useful, the most genuinely explanatory, is going to depend. Sometimes maybe a mostly biological explanation is going to do the work for you. Sometimes sociological variable is going to do more of the work for you. Other times psychological. Now, let's talk about the implicit psychology and concept of the person in morality and law. First, I need to say something breathtakingly superficial just so that we're all on the same page. What is law? Law is simply a set of rules and I'm going to use rules broadly to include things that aren't bright line, like the president's got to be 35, things like you've got to behave reasonably, which are called standards. It's rules that are meant to guide behavior. Law gives you a reason to behave one way versus another. So, what kind of creature can be guided by rules? Because think, unless the addressee of those rules could actually be guided by them, then in fact, law would be incoherent. It would be useless. By the way, in this respect, law is like custom, morality, etiquette, social norms. They're all ways that humans have devised to give each other reasons about how we ought to live together. Okay, so the kinds of creatures that can be guided by reason are the kinds of creatures to whom law is addressed. Well, that is a folk psychological creature. By folk psychology, I don't mean anything pejorative. I mean the technical term in the philosophy of mind and action and in psychology that refers to a partial, and I underline 37 times, partial explanation of human behavior in terms of mental states. So once again, I've said, why are you sitting here in the room today? Well, we could give biological variables, we could give psychological variables, we could give sociological variables, but a crucial part of the explanation for why you're sitting here today would be what's called a practical syllogism, a desire, belief, intentional set. You desire to learn something about this topic. You desire to get, I don't know if you get CME credit for coming here today. You desire to show up and see your friends and eat the wonderful food outside. You believe by coming to this talk you'll satisfy those desires. You form the intention to be here, and here you are. Now, I cannot tell you how many rooms of neuroscientists I say to them, why are you here? And nobody tells me a story about the brain and the nervous system. They tell me a story about, you know, they try to, but they can't. And they tell me a story about the folk psychology along the lines I just gave them. Well, if, if I'm right, what are the criteria for responsibility? They're not brain criteria. Their criteria having to do with the ability to be guided by reason. So let's go to the real common sense level. 
what groups of people do we typically hold as a class, obviously this could be individual variation, but as a class, what groups of people do we hold less responsible? Young children, some people with severe mental disorder, some people with severe neurological disorders that have behavior sequelae and all that sort of thing. What do all those classes have in common? They have in common that their capacity to be guided by reason, whether as a result of immaturity or as a result of abnormality, is diminished. And so basically, the capacity for rationality not only is the foundation for law, it's the foundation for responsibility altogether. Now, here are some confusing, misleading, and false explanations for excuse and mitigation, for holding people non-responsible. The reason I bring them up is because this is a mistake made all, these are the false explanations that are mistakenly made all the time by the sufferers from what I have identified in the published literature now as brain overclaim syndrome. This is the attempt to say, once you learn something about the brain, we now get it all, and the world is going to become a kinder, gentler, greener place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What I call irrational neural law exuberance. And I have recommended a treatment, cognitive neurotherapy. It's 100% effective if people will do it, and it's non-invasive, and it's not that expensive. You can do it at home. You don't need to have a therapist, but it still goes on. And you know, in the article, I've got a set of criteria for it. All provisional, of course. You know. We've got high interrate reliability, but we're still waiting for the validity studies. Okay, first, neuroscience shows determinism is true. False. It doesn't. No science could show determinism is true. And neuroscience is no more convincingly neuro, uh, deterministic than any other science. Hold aside all the disputes about whether the world is really deterministic, isn't it probabilistic, and da, da, da. Hold on that aside. Let's just do this again at the common sense superficial level. Moreover, even if determinism is true, which we will only know, by the way, if we step outside the universe and look in. As long as we're part of the universe, we'll never know for sure. And even we doctors and lawyers can't do that. University professors often think they can, but they can't. Okay, let's assume determinism is true. Is it really the case that no one can be responsible, that no one has sufficient freedom of the will to be held responsible? And the answer is, it is an utterly disputed topic among the experts in this area, the philosophers of responsibility. The dominant view is, even if determinism or something like it is true, a causally closed world, etc., etc., universal causation, something like that, even if all that is true, we can still be genuinely responsible. We don't need the godlike power of being able to act uncaused by anything but ourselves. We don't need it. So, determinism, even if neuroscience could somehow prove determinism, it doesn't mean we can't be responsible. People often think, gee, if I've identified a cause for a behavior, it must be excused. But that's just demonstrably false. We all know that we live in a causal universe. We may not know all the causes, but if we had the data, we would be able to show all the necessary, sufficient, and predisposing causes of any behavior. Does that mean we're not responsible for any of our behavior just because there might be causes, including causes over which we have no control? The answer is no. And I could give you a wonderful example. Here's the demonstration I do. It takes a little too long. I ask all the people in the room who have originally brown hair, and who are wearing aids to vision, which in a group like this is you know, 90 plus percent, to raise their non-dominant hand when I tell them to. Now, what color your hair is originally, that ain't up to you. Whether you're wearing eye vision aids is really not up to you. What handedness you have is not up to you. And when I utter the words, please do it now, is not up to you. Well, what happens in a nice cooperative audience of weenies like us? Because we didn't get to be where we are by not being cooperative with people like me in situations like this. So everybody raises their non-dominant, the brown-haired, visionated people raise their non-dominant arm. Exactly. So 
utterly predictable, utterly caused. Would anyone think that was a random event in the universe when, when I say, please do it now, everybody raises their non-dominant hand if they were in the proper class? And then I say, thank you for being so cooperative. Were these people responsible for raising their non-dominant Of course they were. It was totally caused, but what was the excusing or mitigating condition? There wasn't one. I mean, this causal theory of excuse, which I have called fundamental psycholegal error, would mean no one's responsible for anything. And that's not the moral and legal world we live in. The moral and legal world we live in holds some people responsible and some people not. We think there are distinctions. Causation is not compulsion, right? If I ask you all to cooperate with this demonstration, and you all do, you're all caused, but none of you is compelled. I didn't hold a gun to anybody's head. I didn't say, I'll physically break your arm if you don't. I didn't say, you'll be kicked out of this university if you don't. There are no threats. Prediction is not an excuse. It was 100% predictable that the people in the audience when I do this would cooperate, except, as I'm fond of saying, with the odd person who suffers from oppositional defiant disorder. That person may not cooperate, but everyone else does. And that doesn't mean you don't deserve your thank you. You do, even though it's utterly predictable. So these are non-starters. What are the starters in law are precisely what I suggested before. You lack sufficient capacity for rationality. That is an excusing or mitigating condition. You have Incipient frontotemporal dementia, are you necessarily incompetent? Not necessarily. We look at that functionally. What can you understand? Do you understand what you're doing? Can you make decisions for yourself? Just because you have the disease doesn't mean you're not competent. We have to evaluate that behavior. Now, there's a second and independent control condition, uh, excuse me, non-responsibility condition, lack of control. If we have something purely mechanistic, a choreiform bodily movement, obviously you can't control that. Oh, I suppose you could tie your arm to the side of your body. But you can't control it intentionally. Are there such things for intentional action as, I really can't help myself, I really can't control myself, that can be conceptualized and measured independently of a rationality program problem? That is a major problem in the psychology of self-control. I'm just going to leave it open for now because it's not necessarily got to be answered for purposes of my talk. If you're attracted to self-control criteria for non-responsibility, fine. Everyone accepts that there are rationality criteria. Okay. So the question for neuro is how precisely do neuroscientific findings, and by the way, I would add to that genetic findings, psychological findings, any kind of findings, how precisely do they answer a legal question? And here you've got the problem of translation. Because neuro is a purely mechanistic explanatory level. As I'm fond of saying, neurons don't have aspirations. They don't have a, past, a sense of past, present, and future. They don't have goals. There's nothing even the connectome cares about. It's people who have aspirations, a sense of past, present, and future, goals, and who care about things. So how are you going to do the translation from the purely mechanistic to the folk psychological? This is going to be compared to psychology and psychiatry. As I'm fond of saying, sometimes treat people as a bit of meat, and sometimes treat them as a psychological acting agent. For example, let's say you go to your meds doc who you know, does your psychotropic meds. If he or she is any good, they're not only just going to give you their med, your meds, they're going to say to you, well, how are you doing? How are things going at home? How are things going at work? How are you feeling? How are you getting along? They're going to ask about you as an acting human being as well as how can I tweak your transmitters? So, Psychology and psychiatry are in a better position than neuroscience because the translation is easier. It's more of a narrative, just the way law is a narrative. Now, actions speak louder than images. 
What I mean by that is this. Since the law's criteria are behavioral, and by behavior I mean acts and mental states. And by mental states I mean not only things like intentions and desires, and I also mean things like feelings. You know, you're angry, or you're sad, what was your psychological experience of that? Since law is purely behavioral, acts and mental states, if there's a disjunct between any scientific finding and the actual real world behavior, we must believe the behavior, holding aside questions of malingering. There, there might be a problem. But holding aside questions, we have no reason to think somebody's malingering. This is not only a problem in neuroscience, just an example I'm fond of using is you all know much better than I do that the correlation between lumbar spine injuries or deterioration and back pain is insecure. Some people who have bad looking spines don't have pain and some people have real pain without it. Well, suppose somebody has been in an industrial accident, claims such bad lower back pain that he or she is disabled and the lower spine scan looks terrible. Well, it's consistent with the back pain, but now the insurance investigators expect, expect fraud. So they send an investigator. What does this person do for fun? They jump up and down on a trampoline. Sorry, they don't have disabling back injury. You know, if somebody's brain looks terrible, but they are a rational agent, they're rational. If their brain looks perfectly okay, but there's, again, no evidence of malingering, they have a classic onset, let's say, of schizophrenia at 18, where you've got the prodrome and you've got the onset of delusions or hallucinations. You've got the six months of deterioration. I don't care what their brain looks like. They're an irrational agent and need to be treated as such. Now, all too often in neuro law, by the way, people will use a finding to try to make a legal claim because the finding has rhetorical relevance but not real relevance. Here's my favorite example. And I've actually done this with federal judges. Dr. Jai has already heard this story. Remember that spider Siskoff case about the subarachnoid cyst who killed his wife? Well, when you hear the behavioral history, everybody wants to convict. Every federal judge I've presented this case to, and it's now hundreds, wants to convict. But then I say to them, well, would you admit that scan? Would you consider this cyst at sentencing? And a minority do. So then I do, you've all seen the paper, Chase, I scrap the judges, which they hate and I love to do because they hate it. And I call, so Judge Jayadev, you voted to convict, but you said you were going to take it into account at sentencing. Why? Well, he's got a hole in his head. So what? What's the mitigating condition? You know, I got a hole in my head too, but what's the mitigating condition? Well, he's got a hole in his head. Your Honor, a hole in the head is not a legal mitigating condition. Does it cause him to be irrational? Does it cause him to have a control problem? Okay, here are the two challenges of neuroscience to personhood, agency, and responsibility. Determinism I've already talked about. The more interesting one from your point of view, I should think, uh, let me do this very briefly. In thinking about all of this, the question comes up, reductionism. Are we nothing but our brain states? And this is a philosophy of mind problem, which may or may not be solved by future advances. And what I call is what to do until the doctor of metaphysics arrives. And by the doctor of metaphysics, I mean Dr. Spock, and I mean Benjamin Spock, the baby and child care expert, not Spock of Star Trek. So when my daughter was a tyke, I swore by his book, and I was reading through it, and he had this little riff in there. What if your child, this would have been in the 70s, what if your child, and you're on the prairie, and you can't get to a doc, and doc can't get to you for hours and hours, and your child has diarrhea, and you have no medicine in the house, what do you do until the doctor comes? So he says, well, go into the kitchen. You got a little oatmeal? You got some apples? You know, what do you got? And let's do a little home brew that'll be a bit binding, Relieve the child, child won't get so dehydrated. What do you do until the doctor comes? Well, that's what I'm looking for, because the metaphysicians, they ain't going to solve these problems. <laughs> so here's the problem. We don't know how the brain enables the mind or how action is possible. 
There's nothing mysterious. I assume it's a problem, at least in theory, so soluble by science, but it's simply beyond us at present. There is no satisfying, at present, scientific or conceptual account of the mind-brain, which is how I refer to it, because clearly you don't got a mind without a brain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem of intertheoretic reduction. I know from long experience that many neuroscientists, neurosurgeons, and neurologists they can't live their life this way, but they think in theory you're nothing but your brain states, or you're nothing but your neurological states. Or your... This is the problem of inter called intertheoretic reduction. Can we reduce one phenomenon to allegedly a more basic underlying explanatory phenomenon where the higher level explanation is doing no explanatory work, not really. All the explanatory work is being done by the lower level. Well, you probably all remember from somewhere in your education that the major intertheoretic reduction that was supposed to be the vanguard was chemistry to physics. We don't have a clue how to do it. Not a clue. And the notion that we could reduce our mental phenomena to biological phenomena at present is a pipe dream. It's poppycock. We wouldn't even know how to begin doing it. Moreover, I would ask, why do you stop at the biological level? Why not go right down to the subatomic level? Or whatever would be the basic, whatever is building blocks of the universe. Let's not reduce to neural states. Let's reduce to strings or whatever. Here's another really important point. The kinds of neuroscience that are going to be important for law are not how does the visual system work? Not mostly. It's going to be cognitive, affective, and social neuroscience, which are basically going to be the science of acting intentional human behaviors. How do you get those data? By characterizing well ahead of time the behavioral phenomena that interest you. So the neural science is not going to be any better than the behavioral science upon which it is based. Indeed, in all of psychology today, I only know one case where the neuroscience seems to have resolved what had been a psychological dispute, which had to do with what the differences are between the long and short-term memory. And that's about the only one, because there were two competing well-characterized psychological states, and it turns out that the neuroscience did the job. All right. I'll do this really fast. There are present scientific and conceptual difficulties, which could be fixed in the future by advances. Anything I say is, I think, where I stand today, but who knows what comes out of the laboratory tomorrow. Again, basic level, we don't know how the brain enables the mind. By and large, because scanning is, scanning is so expensive, small numbers of subjects. As you all know, when you see that report, you're getting an average over subjects in your study, and no individual subject may actually have activated at the spot of interest, the region of interest. Ecological validity. So if I'm trying to figure out whether a gangbanger can avoid mugging an easy mark on the street. How relevant is it what a University of Washington student in the psychology department trying to get credit for a course by doing the research does on a Stroop test in the scanner? <laughs> I mean, what we've got is the neuroscience of college students. And are these tasks anything like what we consider in the real world? There was a wonderful meta-analysis in the Archives of Psychiatry just two, three years ago now where someone looked at all the studies showing significant structural differences between people with and without major mental disorder and found they were just riddled with positive result bias. Just riddled. You all know enough that doing the behavioral subtraction is just really, really hard, controlling for everything you need to control for so you can do the right imaging, uh, right, uh, right inferences. If we're doing law and we are doing even individual case adjudication or public policy, 
would you want it based on one laboratory finding with eight subjects? <clears throat> now, who, why don't people do replications by and large in cognitive, affective, and social neuroscience? Follow the money. Who gets grants for doing what the other person did? You get grant money for coming up with some new idea of your own. What's in it for you to do the replication? So we don't have much replication. What we now know in, broadly speaking again, behavioral neuroscience is correlational and it is coarse. We know almost nothing causally and nothing fine-grained. Clear-cut problem. I love this one. This goes along with what I said before about the neuroscience piggybacks on behavioral science. Neuroscientists don't go on fishing expeditions. They've got something they've identified in advance as of interest to them. Schizophrenia, impulsivity, whatever it is. They've got well-characterized people who are in their experimental group, and they've got people who clearly don't have the disorder who are in their control group. And there's a clear behavioral cut between them. So now what happens? We scan them, or we do any other kind of test, and what do we find? We find overlapping curves. So, for instance, although there are good data now showing very small structural differences, in the brains of people with major mental disorder and people without, they're not sufficiently sensitive to be used diagnostically. The curves overlap much too much. And that's where we've got the clear cases to begin with, where we didn't need the scan at all. We knew already this person was suffering from schizophrenia. Well, what do you do in the less clear cases? That's where the law needs the help, right? Where we can't do it behaviorally, we can't do the evaluation. Well, those are the cases where it's going to be completely insensitive. So just where we need the help most, we get it least. And for those of you who do this stuff, as I, as I said today to the law faculty, I could teach anybody in a sort of social cognitive effective neuroscience study in about six seconds to do countermeasures that'll drop the accuracy of whatever you're doing, some kind of um, multivoxel pattern analysis that has very way above chance findings. I'll get it to drop to chance in just a few seconds of training. Okay, I've already done that stuff. Let's do the disappearing person, because that's the one that juices everybody these days. All right, here's the drill. Suppose determinism is true. Let's just make that assumption. Two states of the world are possible. State number one, determinism is true. Evolutionary processes are part of that deterministic world, and evolution selection has thrown off creatures that do have mental states that do some work. We've got a perfectly determinist story, but part of that determinist story now involves mental states. Number two, we have mental states, but they do no work. The argument is they're epiphenomenal. Think of them as like your appendix. Although, am I right that these days we now think the appendix does do something? Or not? Yeah. yeah. But the, at least when I grew up, the appendix doesn't do anything, right? So think of your mental state as a little bit like smoke from fire. It exists, but it doesn't do anything. Now, if that is the truth, the second is the truth, that our mental states exist, but they don't do anything, then law makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Because then we have no reason, because reason is a mental state, we have no reason to do anything. I mean, people who make this argument, I say, you're trying to convince me. How are you convincing me? You're convincing me by giving me reasons. Are you trying to tell me your brain is doing something to my brain, and that's all there is? Possible but not bloody likely at all. But if it's true, not only responsibility, but all law goes out the window because law is about creatures who act for reasons. If we don't act for reasons, if we can't be guided by reason, law, morality, norms, custom, etiquette, all the things that guide our lives living together, they go on. So compatibilism, the view that you can be both responsible and determinism is true, doesn't save us. Because now we're saying we're not the kinds of creatures we think we are. Compatibilism accepts we're the kind of creatures we think we are. 
Well, there's a bunch of indirect evidence. In the interest of time, because I want to leave 10 minutes for questions, let me just say I go through all the evidence there is for this extravagant claim, the radical claim. It's preposterous based on the current science. Utterly preposterous. They couldn't begin to cash out this claim. And by the way, it leaves you normatively inert. Because if reasons don't matter, should we be Republicans or should we be Democrats? Should we be socialists or should we be capitalists? Should we be kind or unkind? Those are things for which one has reasons. But if reasons don't mean anything, there's no reason to do anything. You can't just sit there and wait for determinism to happen. We're the kinds of creatures who have to deliberate and have to act. Okay. I've been pretty skeptical and negative so far. Let me say what I think neuroscience can do. Some people think it's just a category error to think that brain stuff can affect folks' psychological stuff. I don't. I don't think it can tell us how to live together, but I think it can give us data that would help us decide how to live together, that would give us reasons to do one thing versus another. Uh, let me just... These are the areas where I think we could get some help. Let me give you three examples, and then I'll return to Mr. Off. There are in criminal law examples where I think the current neuroscience looks very promising for law. The first is this neural prediction. There are now two proof of concept studies that show if you add a neural variable to what is our typical psychological algorithms for predicting future behavior, you may actually get a marginal increase in accuracy. If we could do that and it was cost effective, then what's the argument for doing something worse that we've already decided we have a right to do? If we have a right to do prediction, what's the argument for doing it worse as opposed to better? So if we can cost effectively do better with neural signatures, fine, I'm all for it. Here's a second one. Assessing the accuracy of memory is really important in the law, as you can imagine. There are now studies that show basically that using whole brain multi-voxel pattern analysis, you can actually really above chance assess the accuracy of memories of things people have gone through. This is really fascinating research, so clever in its methodology. It's very, very exciting. The third, and this is something that will be put probably more up all your alleys, as some of you probably know, in the tort system, the civil injury system in the United States, pain and suffering is often a crucial variable for damages. As you all know, it is assessed subjectively these days. Oh, yeah, if someone is cringing, you know, that's a sign, and we can object. We can look objectively whether they're cringing or wincing or something. But ultimately, how you feel, one to ten. Ten is the worst, one is the least. Tell me how you feel. Wouldn't it be great if we could get an objective measure of degree of suffering? And in fact, in laboratories, both in the United States and especially the UK as well, we are moving towards this. And I think this is really promising and it would revolutionize our tort systems. Let me conclude with Mr. Roth. Let me, I'm going to do this very briefly and then that will leave us about 10 minutes for questions, which is what I told the drill was. As I said to you, Time one is when he touched the kids. The law's criteria are behavioral. They're not neuro. I concede fully that the tumor was a but-for cause of the urges, and without the urges, he would not have touched his stepdaughter. There's no question about that. And he's been dealt a very bad hand. It's not his fault he has the tumor. But as I'm fond of saying, what pedophile is responsible for becoming a pedophile? I mean, no one chooses when they're 16 and 17 years old when you decide what your sexuality is. Well, as I said at the law school, being a wise guy as always, well, between adult consenting partners and shoes and everything in between, so no one looks at the list and says, I choose to be a pedophile. You discover you are, and it's not your fault. So you've got the urges too, and they're not your fault. Remember, we're asking was he responsible for acting on them? So now the question is, did he lack sufficient capacity for rationality to be excused? Or 
Did he lack sufficient capacity for self-control? Remember that he looked utterly unremarkable. If his stepdaughter had never outed him, it would never have become apparent to anyone until he had deteriorated further. I don't know enough about him at time one. Maybe there's other stuff I would learn that would suggest to me he did have a substantial rationality problem even then, or had a substantial, if you believe in this kind of talk, self-control problem even then. I just don't know enough. So I'm agnostic, but it's not clear to me just because the tumor played a causal role that he's not responsible. That's the fundamental psycholegal error. Causes aren't excuses per se. Causes have to actually cause a genuine excusing condition. What about time two? Months later, you know, instructional apraxia, agraphia. He's got the gait problem. He's urinating on himself. He's acting in ways publicly that are getting him in really serious trouble and that are counter to his own desires, expressed desires. He asked him, do I want to go to prison? He would say, of course not. And he's acting on them all the same. I still don't know whether he's responsible or not, but taking it all into account, I'm clear if he were charged with technically battery, unconsented to touching of the nurses in the consulting room, I would excuse him. There's just too much evidence that is inconsistent with him having sufficient capacity for rationality to be held responsible. That's time two. Time one, I'm agnostic. So, conclusion. We are acting agents, not Pinocchios. Our brains are not Geppettos pulling our strings. Agency is secure, at least for now, and probably forever. Jerry Fodor, by the way, is a philosopher of mind and action, extraordinarily well-versed in the neurosciences, who has this wonderful passage where he says, if we're wrong about the importance of mental states in our lives, that's the wrongest we've been about anything except our common sense physics. He said, we believe there are mid-sized objects in the universe. That's for him everything from molecules to galaxies. If we're wrong about their existence, that would be even wronger about mental states. But mental states, that's about as wrong as we can get if we think they're not important. And he says, finally, at the end of this passage from his book, Psychosemantics, be of good cheer, everything is going to be all right. So don't get demoralized, you're going to be fine. Questions? No questions? Yes, sir. So what about the, in the law, in the criminal process, what about the issue of the person who committed the act. They did. Mm -hmm. Versus what you do about it. Okay. And isn't that where you should begin to bring in issues of what may or may not have caused it? No. Okay, I'm supposed to repeat the questions for people who are off site. So the question is in the criminal law, shouldn't we be more concerned to use the neuroscience and our causal information in deciding how to respond to the person? as opposed to be thinking about culpability. And the Mr. Off case is a classic example. Suppose, for example, that you think at time one, he actually was responsible. That's the way you come out. By the way, that's not a scientific question. That's a normative question. Does he meet our criteria for responsibility? Let's assume you think he does. But it's also the case that you now think we don't need to lock him up in any way because he's no longer dangerous once the tumor has been resected. Furthermore, even letting him go isn't going to deter anybody, it isn't going to undermine deterrence because other people are not going to think they're going to get away with it because they're going to have a brain tumor too or something of the sort. So we could safely let him go. Does it make sense to put him in prison? The answer is, what's your theory of punishment? If your theory of punishment is people should get what they deserve, you might still want to punish him because he deserved it, even if he's no longer dangerous. To see that, some of you are old enough to remember Watergate. Does the name Chuck Colson ring any bells? He was one of the rat fuckers and one of the T, that's what they called him, excuse me for using the law French in this hallowed <laughs> auditorium. Uh, 
Before he went to prison, he had an absolute, there was no question about the sincerity, he had an absolute conversion to Christ. And he has spent his life, his entire time in prison, and ever since, doing Christian ministry to prisoners, leading a very, very humble life otherwise. He's won all sorts of big money prizes, he donates everything. Once he had that conversion, he was no danger. He didn't need to go to prison for safety or deterrence or anything of the sort. And yet, many of you would probably say he should go to prison because he deserved it. So the question is, are you a, a mushy mixed theorist like me, or are you a pure retributivist who thinks people should get what they deserve? Since I'm a mushy mixed theorist, I think he deserves something. I'd give him minimal time, and I would use this evidence or any other evidence people could give me to decide how long I needed to keep him in, and he would be on the way short side of whatever range was available to me as a sentencing judge. But again, everything depends on what your theory of punishment is, what you're trying to achieve with the... Uh, well, my point would be, isn't that something that the community and the system needs to deal with? Yes, it absolutely is, and we talk about it all the time. I mean, we in the criminal justice system talk about these questions all the time, and there are major disputes about which theory of punishment and what the state should be doing when it finally has cause to clutch somebody. So it's a great question. It's an absolutely great question. So who decides? The legislature, finally. Hey, uh, no, thanks. Great talk and a lot of thought provoking stuff. Um, I have a question. So I'm sitting here sort of thinking about the maybe counterparts to my argument that I've listened to TED Talks and Sam Harris and things like that. Oh. I know, right? Um, but so, confused puppy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But um, so what I'm wondering is this focus on the punishment and what we're going to do in criminal courts is that maybe impeding some of our understanding of our behavior? So you know, you, I think you illustrated it great when you said, you know, here's a pedophile who we know what caused it, we can kind of show the pathways and the frontal lobe and all that, but something caused the other pedophile. To that their upbringing or to whatever it is. Um, and so is it on a gradient? So can can we try to understand, say, why cults form and why there's mass suicide? Can we start to understand these behaviors that must have some kind of reductionistic cause without getting bogged down with, well, they're just going to get off? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it was really two or three questions, so I need to repeat them. I will leave out the compliment. The question is, does criminal law impede our ability to understand human behavior? And I think the second question was, aren't there some kinds of behaviors that can be best explained mechanistically as opposed to in terms of folk psychologically? Two good questions. I think the answer to number one is no. I don't see how the criminal law impedes our ability to search for knowledge or search for it all the time. The question is, are there going to be some sorts of social phenomena behavior that would be better understood at the mechanistic level at present than at the folk psychological level primarily? And I think given our current state of knowledge, no. We should certainly be looking for them, but in deciding what to do with limited resources, where would you put your research dollars? And you all are chasing grants, you know about this. Where would you put your money? So Jim Jones drinking the Kool-Aid at Jonestown. Would you be putting your money into a neuro explanation for that, or would you be putting your money into a social psychological group influence explanation of that, for example? And on that particular example, I'd sure go for the social psychological, if it were up to me. Uh, I think very few of the things the criminal justice system is concerned with are going to be largely best understood mechanistically, but I am certainly open to the possibility, and if someone's got a really good idea that looks like it's going to have payoff, then I'd fund it. But here's my cautionary counter tale, and I was discussing this with one of your colleagues earlier today. As probably most of you know, Big Pharma is no longer investing in developing new psychotropic agents. They spend all their money tweaking already successful agents, tweak a molecule here, tweak a molecule there, keep the license for 20 years, make a lot of dough. Why isn't Big Pharma putting money into new agents? 
because we've hit the wall in our understanding of the relation between brain and behavior. And remember, even now, DSM-5, all psychiatric conditions are evaluated purely behaviorally. There are no biomarkers at present sufficiently sensitive to be used outside the laboratory. So, if we've hit the wall, you're not going to throw a potential billion dollars at a scientist to go on a fishing expedition. You better have a good theoretical account of why we're going to look here as opposed to there. And so what I would say is anybody who wants to go mechanistic on me when it comes to social phenomena, I say, tell me a story. I want this to be a better place, the world to be a better place. You got a good story? If you're up to me, I'd fund you. So that was uh, that was tons of uh, that was a really a lot of fun. Uh, Thanks. And, uh, I would have to say that uh, people walked into this uh, auditorium on an average day, uh, believing in some black and some white. Uh, and when it comes right down to it, there is no black and white. Uh, it essentially disappears on really intense scrutiny. I agree. Uh, our job, I think, is better than yours uh, because you have to fashion some black and white out of this muddle of the world that we live in. Right. Uh, it, uh, a metaphor occurred to me. Um, stop and go lights. Uh -huh. uh, they're incredibly important. We have laws that relate to stop and go lights. But if you're at a stop and go light at four o'clock in the morning and there's nobody on the road, you don't need a stop and go light. And you would be insulted if somebody accused you of rolling through that and gave you a ticket for that. Because it's just, it, it seems... I don't think you'd be insulted. You'd be, well, you'd be pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, but it's, it's a great question. The question was, for those off-site, neurology and the sciences understand that virtually all the phenomena we're concerned with are continuum phenomena, but the law needs to draw bright lines. Just in arranging human affairs, we simply can't do the infinite gradation. So it's very hard. And it's interesting... Because the questions involve human behavior and they're so important to us, and we understand they're so important to us and to the lives of the people that these decisions affect, and others have a lot of normative import, what we're always trying to do is import science into the law to give us the answer. Because precisely what you said, we have a muddle, it's a hard decision, Doc, tell me the answer. The problem is, Docs can't tell us the answer. Scientists can't tell us the answer. They can give us data. They can tell us about the continuum, but they can't tell us where to put the cut points and stuff like that. That is inevitably the normative social question. It's unavoidable for creatures like us who have to live together. Did I see another hand? Because we're about out of time, so. Yes, sir. So okay. it, it also reminds me to go back to uh, your thoughts about the, the reasoning brain versus the non-reasoning brain, and the law doesn't apply to people who can't reason at all. Oh, it applies, it just doesn't give them any responsibility. Right, so, so the, the prop, one of the problems is defining that, that's a continuum. Absolutely. Uh, and defining that is extremely difficult, uh, and one of, one of the examples that I think you, you mentioned was competence. Mm -hmm. and I, discovered a while ago that the legal people thought medicine had definitions of competence and the medical people thought competence was defined by law. It is, just badly. <laughs> and and e either, either one defines it very well. Uh, but the issue constantly comes up uh, and it's, it's, it's this continuum kind of problem and it has to do with the continuum of reasoning. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Competences are always functional. If you ask about competence to accept medical treatment, competence to refuse medical treatment, competence to take part in a research study and the like, in the law, competence to stand trial, competence to be sentenced, God forbid, competence to be put to death, which is, by the way, a hot issue the Supreme Court hasn't decided yet, whether you can involuntarily medicate somebody to make them competent so that they can be executed. It's a hot topic. All of these are functional. What we're asking in all these contexts is, is the person rational enough in the context in question to be given legal responsibility? 
not to be treated paternalistically. And the law has developed lots of criteria. There have been instruments developed to help the decision makers decide whether the person meets the law's criteria, but you can never use these instruments alone. They have to be triangulated with other data. In many contexts in law, what really happens is so competence to stand trial is a classic example. The federal Constitution says you cannot be tried. Even if you could get an entirely fair trial, you cannot be tried if you are incompetent. So this, if this ever comes up, it's got to be evaluated. And the forensic psychologists and psychiatrists who do this, they come in and they say, I think he is or I think they isn't, and what, and, and what, the, and what does the judge do? Rubber stamps as opposed to the court making a good independent evaluation of whether the person is or isn't. It's an attempt, once again, to offload. And the problem is precisely that the last two questions are suggested. We've got this continuum. It's a verbal formula. Does the person understand the nature of the proceeding, and can the person rationally assist counsel? I give you with that, that is totally vague. How much understanding? How much assistance? I'll leave you with not a competence question, but a, a question that is precisely similar. You all remember Andrea Yates, the Texas mom who drowned her five kids? You may recall, by the way, even the prosecution conceded she was really whacked. And you know, that's a technical term. And what she believed, delusionally believed, was she was corrupting these children. If she didn't kill them now, they would become corrupt. If corrupted, they would spend all eternity being tortured by Satan in hell. Now, eternity is a long time, and torture is no fun. So she decided, I'm going to kill them now. So the Texas standard for legal insanity was, did she know right from wrong? Well. That could be interpreted narrowly, or that could be interpreted broadly. Did she know it was against the law of Texas? Yes. Did she know that her neighbors would not approve? Yes. But did she know that she was really doing something unjustifiable? When she really believed that my neighbors knew what I knew, they'd think I was justified. So, did she know right from wrong? Narrowly, yes. Broadly, no. Did she know what she was doing? The other standard. Did she know she was killing her kids? Yes. Did she know drowning kills them? Yes. Did she intend to do it? Yes. But why did she do it? Here's the thing. The fMRI can't tell you why. And we're interested in the why. Why'd you do it, Ms. Yates? I did it to save my kids. Did she know what she was doing? Narrowly, yes. Broadly, no because her material reason for action, what motivated her, was crazy. And it was not that she was just making a mistake because she wasn't careful. She was crazy. And so broadly speaking, she was clearly not knowing what she was doing. Narrowly, she was. And so the, remember, the first Texas jury convicted her. And everyone said, oh, see, here's the problem with Texas. It needs a control standard as well as a cognitive standard. The cognitive standard is unscientific. The cognitive standard for legal insanity, knowing what you're doing, knowing right from wrong, is not a scientific standard. It's a normative, moral, and legal standard. The problem with Texas was not its science. It was its morals. It interpreted legal insanity much too narrowly. All Texas needed to do to do justice was to interpret it more broadly. And the interesting thing was, of course, there was an error at the first trial, so she had to be retried. The second jury, under the exact same standard, acquitted her. That's what happens when you have these vague standards. It leaves lots of room for discretion.